The Intercontinental Championship was, at one point in time, a major deal, viewed as a potential stepping stone to the world title and main event stardom. Nowadays, Shinsuke Nakamura can hold it for four months and not defend it a single time. But I digress. While everyone who wins the IC title probably hopes they're the next Randy Savage, Chris Jericho or Bret Hart, the reality is often far different from the fantasy. The title's history is long and illustrious, but you might have some trouble remembering these less than stellar title holders. I'm Sam from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WWE Intercontinental Champions you don't remember. Join us. Number 10, Test. Test, test, this is the time to talk about test. Now, eagle-eyed viewers will know that we've used that joke in a video once before, but if WWE can book the same goddamn match finish 37 times a year, distraction roll-ups are great, then you'll allow me to dust off a classic. Especially when it comes to talking about Test, the big man who at one time WWE had seemingly big plans for. The master of the big boot beat Edge to bag the IC strap on the November 5th, 2001 episode of Raw. From there though, the Alliance member held it for 13 measly days, managing to squeeze in a solitary title defense against Matt Hardy before dropping it back to his countrymen at Survivor Series, in a bout that unified the Intercontinental and WCW United States title. Titles. Clearly, this very short run was designed with the unification match in mind, and WWE didn't give Test the belt as the start of some prolonged singles push to the top. On the contrary, after he dropped it, he slid right back into the tag scene as a member of the yet-to-be-named Un-Americans. Number 9. The Godfather During the height of the Attitude Era, the Intercontinental title began to lose a little bit of its luster. It was no longer the workers' title, the belt put on those with reputations for routinely delivering gripping bouts between the ropes. It was passed around with alarming frequency because whoever was writing at the time must have felt like the belts were just props bro. That is how the IC strap found its way across the waist of The Godfather, everyone's favorite pro wrestling pimp. The Godfather was a great character and was seriously over, but he didn't need the Intercontinental title. His shtick wasn't great matches, although in this era those were few and far between anyway, it was catchphrases and signature spots. He was, in many ways, the perfect opening match act and wasn't destined to shoot up the card. He won the title in a short, forgettable match against Goldust on the April 12, 1999 episode of Raw and lost it to Jeff Jarrett on the edition of the show that aired on May 31st. On television, Godfather defended the title against Hardcore Holly, Goldust, Jarrett, The Blue Meanie and Road Dog. Few of those passed the five minute mark. Number eight, Rikishi. Rikishi could have been a damn fine intercontinental champion if he'd been given more time holding the belt. Because he really was on fire when he beat Chris Benoit to capture it on the June 22, 2000 episode of SmackDown. The big man with the big ass had become one of the most popular acts in the company thanks to his alliance with Too Cool, Stink Face Finisher, and post-match dance routine. There were hopes that the former head shrinker could be a main event player, as evidenced by his ill-fated heel turn and programs with Steve Austin and The Rock later in the year. So it made sense to give him a shot with the IC title. Alas, he only defended it twice on television. A rematch with Benoit, which ended in DQ, and a bout with Triple H, which ended in double countout. Yay! Before he dropped it to Val Venus on July 6th. All told, Rikishi was only in possession of the Intercontinental title for a fortnight. His subsequent feud with Venus was a good one and yielded a cracking cage match at Fully Loaded, but Kish failed to regain the title and subsequently floundered before becoming a baddie. Number 7. The New Age Outlaws No, no, the New Age Outlaws tag team didn't hold the Intercontinental title at the same time or anything, though with Vince Russo calling the shots back then, you wouldn't put it past them. But Road Dogg and Billy Gunn did have, separately, two short and unmemorable reigns as champion. The D.O.G. was first to bag it, beating Val Venus on the March 15, 1999 episode of Raw. He defended it against his partner, who was then Hardcore Champion the next week, in a winner-take-all match that ended in a no contest, before successfully defending it in a four-way at WrestleMania 15. 
He then dropped it to Goldust the next night on Raw. As for the one Billy Gunn, he beat Eddie Guerrero to win his on the November 23rd, 2000 episode of SmackDown. He defended it on television twice, a rematch with Latino Heat and a DQ win over Val Venus, before relinquishing it to Chris Benoit at Armageddon. The 17-day IC title run was the latest attempt to make Mr. Ass a main event player, but they did a bomb job of it. Number 6. JBL When Bradshaw went from beer-drinking tag team mid-carder to Wall Street savvy main eventer, it completely transformed his career. The tall Texan was catapulted to the main event scene and, before too long, he had beaten Eddie Guerrero to win the WWE title. More amazingly still, JBL was no mere transitional champion. He held the title for close to a year before losing it to John Cena at WrestleMania 21 and then had a decent run as United States champion before retiring to the announce desk for the first time in May of 06. But people tend to gloss over his post-comeback 27-day intercontinental title run. JBL beat CM Punk to win it on the March 9th, 2009 episode of Raw in one of the last matches of his career. He clearly only won it so he could then lose it to Rey Mysterio at WrestleMania 25 in what was JBL's in-ring swan song. He could have actually been a really strong IC champ at this point in his career, but alas, he was totally broken down with injuries and ready to call it a day. Zero defenses too, before he lost to Mysterio in just 21 seconds at the Showcase of the Immortals. Number 5. Marty Jannetty Poor Marty Jannetty, his name forever used as shorthand for the less successful member of a tag team due to the incredible career of his rocker's partner, Shawn Michaels. The thing is, Marty could have been a genuine star in his own right. He had the talent and he had his fans, but it never quite happened. The closest he got was his one and only intercontinental title reign, which began when he vanquished the Heartbreak Kid on the May 17th, 1993 episode of Raw. It was a great ending to the show, as WWE's flagship was starting to find its footing, but it was a move designed to create interest and generate a rating, rather than as part of any long-term plans for Jannetty. Jannetty was released after the pair had a stinker at that year's Royal Rumble, but Kurt Mr. Perfect Hennig supposedly convinced Vince McMahon that the poor quality was actually down to HBK and not because Marty was under the influence of anything, as was the commonly held belief. Either way, Jannetty held onto the IC title for 20 days with zero televised defenses before losing it back to Michaels at a house show thanks to interference from a debuting Diesel. Number 4. The Mountie. The very definition of a transitional champion, the alter ego of Jacques Rougeau won the Intercontinental title just so he could lose it back two days later. The Mountie upset Bret Hart to bag the IC title at a house show on January 17th, 1992. In the storyline, the hitman was suffering from the flu, though in reality, he was in the middle of negotiating his contract. That was on Friday. Come Sunday, the Mountie was dropping the title to Roddy Piper at the Royal Rumble in a short match. Match. He did receive his contractual rematch on the February 8th episode of Saturday Night's main event, but failed in his pursuit after he attempted to shock Hot Rod with his cattle prod, only for it to have no effect because Piper was wearing a rubber vest underneath his t-shirt. The Mountie was a fun character, but it belonged nearer to the bottom of the card than the top of it. Rougeau is only spared being the shortest reigning champion ever thanks to Zack Ryder's one-day dalliance with the title and Dean Douglas holding it for a cup of coffee due to the click. Number 3. Albert much like we saw with Billy Gunn earlier, Albert was a perennial tag team guy that WWE desperately wanted to make into a single star to no avail. Their earliest attempt came in the summer of 2001, with Albert recently emancipated from the rubbish X Factor group, which also featured X Pac and Just Incredible. In his first major singles match, he beat Kane for the Intercontinental title in a no disqualification match on the June 28th episode of SmackDown. And to be fair to Albert, he actually did defend the title title regularly for the 25 days that he held it. This included meetings with The Undertaker, Edge and Rhino on Raw and SmackDown, as well as bouts with Credible and Tommy Dreamer on Sunday Night Heat. Once he lost the title to Lance Storm the day after the Invasion pay-per-view, he never got another sniff. WWE were in a transitional period at this point in time, and Albert's reign was just something they tried in the hope that it would work. And it didn't. Not too long afterwards, he was rechristened the Hip Hop Hippo and put in a tag team with Scotty Too Hottie. 
Number 2. The Texas Tornado Kerry Von Erich left Texas and joined WWE in 1990, where, as the Texas Tornado, he ran through the promotion with the impact of a light breeze. Tornado had only been in the company a couple of months, and fans were just starting to familiarize themselves with him when he shockingly beat Mr. Perfect for the IC title at SummerSlam. Kerry was subbing for an injured Brutus Beefcake and was a late addition to the card. While the match itself isn't anything special, it was a great moment and it garnered a huge pop. Encouraging signs for his reign to follow, surely, but the Texas Tornado's IC title run has to go down as a forgettable disappointment. Defenses against people like the Brooklyn Brawler, Buddy Rose, Paul Diamond, Haku, and Black Bart didn't exactly set the world on fire. And the truth is, Kerry wasn't the dynamic performer he had been in years past. His reign as Intercontinental Champion lasted around three months and was ended by Mr. Perfect, who won it back on an episode of Superstars. And number one, Ezekiel Jackson. Despite being Intercontinental Champion for a not-too-shabby 54 days, Ezekiel Jackson only defended the title twice on television. Now, it's not hard to see why WWE wanted to push THE Brian Kendrick's former bodyguard. He was big, young, and could be carried to a decent match if he was there with the right person, say, a Christian. He was just missing that certain something, however, and never quite got to that next level. The last ever ECW champion beat Wade Barrett to win the IC title at Capital Punishment 2011. Sadly, the match was pretty bad, and Big Zeke just wasn't over as a babyface, so the fans didn't really care about the switch. He beat Barrett in the rematch later that week on SmackDown and had another token defense against Ted DiBiase Jr., but he was pretty much a house show champion. Not defending the titles bad enough, but WWE didn't do him any favors by having him lose several non-title matches against Christian and Cody Rhodes. Jackson was a beast, but he had his shortcomings both in the ring and on the mic. It was hardly a surprise when WWE made the call to switch the title to Cody Rhodes, who was much better prepared to hold it.